Well, welcome, everybody. Thank you for your patience. And this is kind of unbelievably exciting to all of us because we've been spending the last two years in, the, in the, our profession speaking on Zoom. Um, and so this is the first IRL talk we've all, we, were just, we were just consulted each other. It's our first IRL in two years. So we're delighted to be here. It's not our first talks, but it's our first talks in person. So first of all, thank you to the, uh, I'm Natasha Boas, and I am an uh, independent international curator here in the Bay. And I'm del delighted to be with the community today. At, this is the, the last talk of a great series of programs. So last but not least. And um, so it's the finissage, which we like to say. So thank you to the programming team. We have Susan Swig up here. Thank you, Susan, for your incredible work in gathering the community together. And to Abby Margulis and Laura Fenton. So thank you. And to the whole team, we have other members of the FOG team. Stanley Gaddy is up here, too. So thank you so much for this incredible gift to San Francisco. And it's wonderful to end this whole series of programming with an actual artist talk with two Bay Area artists. So very excited. So with Masako Miki here, was born in Osaka, Japan in 1973 and received her MFA from San Jose State University. She had a Matrix show most recently at the Berkeley Art Museum, Pacific Film Archives, and her l large scale sculptures um, that were commissioned by the Uber headquarters in Mission Bay uh, are up now for everyone to, to partake in. She's also recently uh, had her work acquired by the, uh, SF MoMA, so that's very exciting. She's represented by cult Amy Freeberg in San Francisco and Ryan Lee in New York. I, uh, Woody Othello was born in Miami in 1991 and is a graduate of the California College of Arts, and he received his MFA in 1991. He's going to be included in the upcoming This Present Moment, Crafting a Better World Smith's, at the Smithsonian Art Museum and Renwick Gallery in DC, which is really exciting, coming up soon, and is represented by Jessica Silverman, who I see right in the back and in San Francisco, and Karma in New York. I'm gonna sit down. The title of the talk today is Shapeshifting. And um, shapeshifting seems to be a contemporary zeitgeist concept uh, inside and outside the art world discourse. Both artists here engage in boundary bending forms. They shapeshift formally. And what I'm hoping to do in our discussion today is to touch on other meanings of shape-shifting, the social, the political, the philosophical potentials of, of, the, of this word. Um, and since we are shape-shifting, I thought I would shape-shift this public talk a little bit. And I challenge the two artists here with us today uh, to do some, a Pesha Kusha for us. Does anybody in the audience know what Pesha Kusha format is? It's the sort of fastest growing storytelling format uh, being used in the design and architecture and art world. And I was challenged to, this, to do this in Berlin in October for uh, an international uh, curatorial forum, and I sort of failed at it. <laughs> so I thought I would... Um, ask my two favorite artists, <laughs> two of my favorite artists, to, to try to do this. And what is a Pesha Kusha? A Pesha Kusha, the format started, and I actually saw it for the first time with the California College of, um, of Arts Curatorial Practice Program, MFA group, when we traveled to Japan in 2003, and we were at the Super Deluxe, which what had a Pesha Kusha night in Tokyo, and Super Deluxe is kind of a gallery slash lounge slash bar slash club slash creative hub or kitchen slash slash. It's all about slashing, shape shifting and slashing. And um, so Peshakusha means chit chat in Japanese and the format is 20 slides for 20, you can speak for 20 seconds, you show 20 slides for a total of six minutes and 40 seconds. So I'm going to start out our talk with Woody's Pesha Kusha. 
his first time ever. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so my Pesha Kusha is just stuff that I like. It's not necessarily things um, related to, to like art making, but things that kind of like orbit my, my practice, I feel, and just, yeah. Should be. Um, I'm move over here. So yeah, I've been listening to a lot of jazz music. Well, that was more than 20 seconds. This is the Lonious Monk. I love watching like live <laughs> performance and just seeing their like hands glide across the um, piano. It's like super fascinating and like just super smooth, uh, soothing. Um, the first one was Ma Jamal, and he's like my favorite piano player. Uh, this album by Alice Coltrane, Lord of Lords, is uh, just insane. There's this song called Going Home, and it's like the end of the world meets like sublime, like heaven. It's just like competing like uh, instruments, this organ and this like beautiful harp that like sweeps through. Um, this is an image by Jacob Lawrence, who is like one of my favorite artists. This is from his migration series. Uh, not from, this is from his Haitian Revolution series. Um, this is a portrait of the Haitian general Toussaint Lee Overture. Um, my family's from Haiti, so this kind of like is super close to me. Um, okay, I'm getting more comfortable now, so I'm good. <laughs> Uh, this is the color orange, and I put this up here because orange is just a beautiful color. I like wearing orange t-shirts. It comes up a lot of my work. Uh, this is a still from a Barbara McCullough video called Free w Shopping Bags and Freeway Spirits, and then she interviews a ton of artists in LA during the late 70s about their artist practice and how you know ritual like applies to their art practice. Um, this thing kind of gave me some some confidence in the studio recently and just trusting myself. Uh, this book, Flash of the Spirit, I read a couple of years ago and it just talks about how different African like culture and religion is dispersed throughout the diaspora and how like a lot of like contemporary customs keep a lot of that art alive. This is the first book that I learned about Yoruba. Um, and this is a depiction of two, of Ibeji, a Yoruba deity. Um, and Ibeji means twin. I put this up here because I'm a Gemini and that kind of like twin energy is like super important to me. Um, and the Oct uh, Octavia Butler, the parable series, I, I read throughout the pandemic, which was kind of like not the thing to do because it was <laughs> closely related to the pandemic, but the main character, like Lauren Olimina, is like this like fierce, like just like fierce person, and in the face of like so much adversity, is just able to like strive through. Um, and this is a still from Isaac Julian's Black Skin White Mask, which I actually saw at the Berkeley Art Museum a couple years ago. And seeing that kind of like uh, inspired me to read the book, and that book has just been hella transformative and on in general, just like super uh, radical. This is another kind of like life-changing book for me. Um, Bell Hooks, The World to Change, just got me to really question my, um, my masculinity and like dealing with my emotions and being more vocal with um, just expressing myself and that kind of like translated into being more truthful in my art practice. Uh, Metamorphoses by Franz Kafka and The Nose by Gogol are just like two fascinating stories about the most strangest things happening in everyday life. And I kind of like, like that um, principle of like just the most bizarre thing happening in the most banal every day, which is a perfect segue to this uh, Magritte uh, piece. That Magritte show at SF MoMA was like truly transformative. This image is just bizarre, the scale of the different objects. It's just, I don't know, it's just a lot of questions arise for, for me with this um, image. This next one is Charles White, who he's able to kind of just have so much emotion um, in, in his artwork. I feel like his hands are like super extraordinary. This piece is called O Freedom and this figure's literally clutching like seeds and letting it fall into like the earth. I'm like, I love the potential for that. Um, and 
on the same subject of hands, this is another like huge inspiration, Trenton Doyle Hancock, who just has like the most impeccable style and just like, I love how il illustrative his works are and like studying his practice uh, actually showed me the work of Philip Gustin, which is the next slide. And uh, yeah, Philip Gustin is another one of these artists who are able to take like these everyday objects and just like propel them into a category where they just have like this like otherworldly like narrative. Um, but it's everything is just like super recognizable. Uh, this piece I made in graduate school, I feel like this sculpture, faceless face jug kind of like really set me up or set my art practice up on the trajectory it's at now. Um, totally like serendipitous how this vessel ended up on this base. It's two unrelated things that came together. Um, and this next slide is of my dog Mia, who I adopted <laughs> during the pandemic. Uh, she's just chilling on the couch, kind of looking at me. That's my baby girl. And then the next slide is of a hike I did with my girlfriend a couple months ago in Mount Tam and just being able to spend time outside here in the beautiful Bay Area is just, uh, yeah, that's like a huge part of, uh, of just living. So yeah, hopefully I did not fail at that. I did good, right? You did so okay. well. Yeah. Woo! Woody! Excellent. Excellent. You, yes, you get an A. <laughs> Um, uh, your turn, Masako. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um. Um, one never likes a silence, but um, <laughs> I just wanted to mention a couple of things. At Robert Ferris Thompson book, he was my professor, yeah, and he was amazing. Um, one of the really the first to, to really get in, to actually create the African American Studies program at uh, Yale, so it was pretty cool. And I love that book too. And the, uh, obviously, your references to Franz Fanon, and uh, and a lot of people who are writing about your work are also referencing Fanon when they they think about your work. But um, I'm I'm trying to fill in a gap here. I'm sorry, <laughs> Masako. <Okay. laughs> we have a lot to talk about, but we well. need some more images. That was great. Yeah. Oh, there you go. Oh, now it's so big. <laughs> okay. Should I do I that? Yeah. I mean, okay. Go ahead. I All right. Um, okay. So these are the images. I thought maybe I'd talk about a little bit of my family because the last time I did the talk was X and a Guggenheim. Um, it's kind of helpful to talk about where you're coming from. So I'm from Osaka, I'm a native of Japan, and this is not actually my grandparents' work, but my father's dad was the uh, traditional lacquer artist, and then my mother's side's dad, um, he always made these miniature houses. So I remember seeing them as I grew up. I always had a little miniature like materials laying around, and then my grandpa always had like really brittle fingers because the lockers are really, you know, it really just kind of, it hurts because <laughs> uh, it's a resin from the wood. So anyway, but that's what they did. Hmm. Um, next slide, please. Are you running on 20 seconds? Thanks. Wow. Oh, okay. 
All right, well, I'm going to um, start asking some questions where we are having technical difficulties. And since we do have all of you here and the artists, I'm going to launch into some questions. I'm going to start with Woody, who just gave us his Pesha Kusha. Um, Woody, during your childhood, you were raised in Miami, a family of Haitian descent, and uh, you saw household objects as inanimate presences um, using, use, uh, and you saw these kind of physical states, these tr being transformed. Oh, now, that's, this is Woody's work. <laughs> Oh, okay, so now it's mine, okay. Uh, should I just, okay, so I just included an earlier work. I used to do a lot of um, pointillism and creating more like a mythological, um, like a representational uh, narratives. And this was at the Facebook mural that I did 2015. Um, this is one of the books that I have to relearn about my religions. Um, this is written by Thomas Kaskoulis, and it's an incredible book to really see my Shinto native religion from outside. Um, I'm glad I left Japan to really understand the my cultures, and it was really helpful. I had to leave, and I'm glad. And this is one of the books I read. And this is pr pr probably the most famous, um, like a power spot in Japan. It's in Mie Prefecture. So this is called the, um, the Married uh, Rocks. And we believe that this is where the Japan, the land of the Japan actually started it. And in my work, I talk about this sort of ancient mythology a lot. And I thought it'd be kind of interesting to share. Uh, another residency program that I did in Japan um, I lived in the um, Tokushima prefecture for like four months. The little town with 6,000 people in populations and everybody knows everybody. And I made this um, kind of floating lanterns. Um, this is a sort of visual orientation about the shapeshifters that I kind of recreate and reinvent in my work. Um, this is the uh, a shapeshifter of the biwa, which is the instrument, traditional instrument, and this is the iron pot shapeshifters. So they're ghosts. My little creatures that I was inspired to make in the very beginning, so these are felt, and they're about like a two or three inches tall. Um, Ruth Asawa is, you know, one of the favorite artists of mine, and I connect with her process of making these wire sculptures because she often talk about how when she's making inside, the exterior becomes interior, interior becomes exterior. So there's that kind of blurred boundary that she kind of manifests in her work, which I really relate with her ideas. Another book, Natasha, uh, Roland Burrs is my favorite author. I read his mythologies and other books when I was in grad school. And Empire of Sign is one of the most memorable and it's an inspiration of my process too. Um, how unique the Japanese culture it was and the uh, birth talks about perception of his Japan. So it's not really about defining a meaning of Japan but how everything centered around this nothing and there's no, it's, so the Japan negates having a meaning and context rather than the Western culture is really about having a context and meaning. So I really felt it was interesting to read, um, again, a cultural sort of a, a perception from a French philosopher. And this is the unknown uh, artist from Muromachi period. It's about like a 1400s in Japan. This is the uh, Hyakiyageo, it's the night parade of the 100 demons, which I use the motif of this composition. It's a very elongated shape, and that's basically a pandemonia. So it's an uproar of this discarded object, and this is my evaluation of that idea. <laughs> uh, Hiroshi Sugimoto is one of my uh, recent sort of um, inspirations. I always love his, 
photographies, but I visited the Odawara's um, observatory in Tokyo, uh, in the outskirt of Tokyo. That's where he grew up as well. And this is the, uh, the stage, the glass stage that he built in the institution. This is the Moerenuma Park in Hokkaido uh, by Noguchi Isamu, um, incredible artist that's given me so much inspiration for me. Um, now that I'm doing a lot of public art project, I really start to think about what it means to create the artwork in a public realm rather than creating in a museum and gallery space. This is the Play Mountain, the artificial mountain that was in the uh, Moerenuma Park. And I love how the park was just bare. You have to invent yourself how to interact with the space. Um, and I visited when it was snow in December, and it was, it's just, it was incredible. <laughs> so, um, and this is my Berkeley Art Museum. I was awarded for the Matrix exhibitions, and I, wanted to create this park that can be uh, fun uh, by adults as well. So we have a lot of parks for children, but I think we need a park for the adults. Museum is a little bit like that, I guess. <laughs> yeah, art fair too. Uh, this is my recent commission at the Uber headquarters, and I was uh, really excited to create um, a different, using a different materials. I uh, work with the bronze, Artworks Foundry in Berkeley, which you do too. Uh, so uh, these are gigantic uh, monumental size of the Shave Sisters and they're discarded object as well. Um, the blue one is about 20 feet high. Oh, and the Sapiens book is something that I've been reading. I just finished all this Harari's book, the three books that it was published. And um, now that I'm really thinking about why we need to have a mythologies and why do I have to recreate or reinvent the mythologies for the contemporary time. So um, it's been a quite uh, inspirational book for me. Um, this is the Shenzhen in China. I was able to, I was uh, commissioned to create this uh, gigantic sort of like a park-like installations. Um, they had this um, Bay Area Park, which was um, the, the, the idea about the project was about the boundaries ahead. So it was really thinking about technologies and agriculture, science, and you know, like the whole, like the place was actually designed to have this symposium uh, in Shenzhen and China. And this is one, uh, the very excited, I've been uh, awarded for this um, collaboration with SF, SF MoMA. Um, I'm built designing the benches and the um, ballers and working with the public, uh, San Francisco Public Art. And uh, we redo in a street right by the MoMA to whatever, <laughs> okay. All right, whatever, whatever the end of the street, sorry, <laughs> okay. Thank you, Misako. Okay. Okay. I don't know. I'm not sure what's going to happen with the images, but we're going to launch into the conversation <laughs> nonetheless. So thank you for those two Peshakushas. You did much better than I did, so <laughs> I'm impressed. Um, I wanted, uh, I'm going to start with Woody and your presentation. Uh, I was thinking about when I, I didn't I I was looking at the Peshakusha before uh, the talk and thinking about in some ways how um, artists in today are have to somehow engage in a, or a political discourse and I wanted to 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 ask the question about if your practice is political and in what ways it is and what in ways it's not. And if these that you feel the forces that you know around you are politicizing, um, and when I was reading the new, there's a beautiful catalog that was just published by Jessica Silverman Gallery uh, and Karma uh, on Woody's book. If you haven't seen it, and I have Woody's Fountain, the 2021 to the left here, that was just shown at Jessica Silverman Gallery in his most recent exhibition. Um, just so you know what you're looking at. Um, in, the, in the book, uh, 
there's a wonderful, Mar Mario Gooden writes a beautiful text called The Cultures of the Distempered Environment. And he um, writes about your work in the context of Franz Fanon, which we were talking about before, and Raynard Bannon, arguing that your object and vessels, quote, slump and contort under the weight of precarity felt by brown and black bodies. And they, quote, also point to the engineered social models that produce atmospheres of traumatic environmental control, very heavy. Um, he concludes that your work is what black surrealism would look like. So I thought it was interesting in your Pesha Kusha that you showed us several images from sort of the history of sort of these iconic surrealist uh, images. So how do you respond to his words um, in, that, in that essay? Uh, um, yeah, I don't know if like, I like I set out to like make political words, but I think like objects and the stuff around us like carry a lot of like weight. Um, you know, this faucet um, piece, for example, there is like there's ways to use objects to speak in metaphors. So it's just like this faucet, like the act of like cleaning our hands and like cleansing ourselves, like the metaphor for water. I think about like reflection, um, but it just shows up as like this big old. <laughs> orange um, faucet piece, but you know, this piece also talks about like, you know, having abundance, but like not having abundance. One side is knotted up and twisted and the other side is like double flowing. So I don't know if I like set out intentionally to be like political, but um, you know, I think like using kind of like the, the, the visual vocabulary, it opens it up for it to be interpreted on like a multitude of levels. And Masako, you, in your, in your artist statement, you talk about your work, especially with the, the shapeshifters and the yokai, uh, which we see here on the right, a series of bronze yokais that were shown at uh, Amy Freeberg's cult this last fall. Um, when you, you talk about them as, as sort of representing this kind of non-binary world, uh, you refer to this multiculturalism, gender fluidity, biraciality, and the fact that we need these new indexes for identity. And, um, and I know you, you mentioned you loved Roland Barthes, who talks about the cultural indexes. Do you, um, how do you feel about this kind of contextualizing work in these ways? Yeah, so I think uh, one of the reasons why that I feel so intrigued by these ancient characters now because of that attributes and idiosyncrasy um, that has been described in, um, in ancient mythologies. So these shapeshifters, they're both animate and inanimate, but they're also secular and sacred. And they don't really choose to be one. They always both, they're never neither or either or. And, but that's how they exist in a story. And um, they always has been. Mm -hmm. And I feel the narrative is empowering because I kind of mirror myself experiences because I've been here more than 25 years, but I didn't grow up here. So English is my second language. Um, but then now at the point where that my Japanese really sucks. <laughs> but I can't even speak English perfect either. So I'm sort of like in the place in between all the time. And then I feel like there are many people, and especially United States is the, the nation of nationalities. And I think there's a sort of shared experiences. And I felt like this shapeshifter brings out that sort of narrative that's okay to be mm -hmm. both. Right. And that's the only way to survive, uh, because then in a, uh, ancient mythology, mm -hmm. they become either human or they become God, and they're not. Mm -hmm. So, Thank you. you know, both of you in your work uh, call from the everyday, uh, those objects that we can find in our homes that are also imbued with these kind of animistic mm -hmm. um, qualities. And I know that, again, oh, I'd mentioned this earlier, but Woody, you were raised in Miami in a family of Haitian descent. And um, you talk about an influence of voodoo folklore. When I look at your work, I think of Santeria as well, you know, this kind of idea of this 
the inanimate or these the powers of these objects and what they can and cannot do in the, in their inanimate states and a kind of sacredness that um, that one experiences in the domestic. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about these stories that had been told to you in your in your being your growing up in your family and how they influenced the work. I feel like I was uh, like my parents are like diehard Catholic, like. Um, but like in that, like in their like the way that they practice Catholicism, I feel like there's some stuff that doesn't like translate to like Roman Catholicism. It's like a very different type of like Hybrid. exactly. So I feel like there are a lot of like, um, and I'm like learning now that there are a lot of like uh, like you know just African tradi traditions that are hiding in plain sight, yeah. and they're like practicing of Catholicism, um, you know. I feel like there's this like uh like this like kind of like essential oil um limasquiti is like is like my mom used to like if I had a bruised leg or like my stomach was hurting my mom would like rub it on whatever wherever it was hurting and she would like say this like prayer in like creole and I'm just like yo this is not <laughs> catholic this is not the catholic thing you think it is I think this is come from somewhere else but you know this is like as I'm like you know, getting older and getting like, just like becoming more interested in like, you know, just like these pre-colonial religions and like marrying the two, like, you know, voodoo in that term was always like a tab, point of taboo with my family, you know? So it was just like, they always kind of like told me to stray away from it. But when I read Flash of the Spirit, learning about more of Yoruba and like learning where, um, you know, like learning where like black strength comes from, I'm like, okay, there's like some type of like education that has gone on that I'm like now trying to like unlearn or kind of like recalibrate. And in your work, you anthropomorphize so many of these these objects. I mean, here we have the faucets and faces on clocks and mirrors that have double faces and telephones with ears and cups with hands. Things that are somehow you've you're you're, you're having us enter into that kind of world i feel like it's already kind of there in the language like when you talk about a clock face or like the face it's just a face you, like, chairs have legs and arms and things like that so it's like something that's kind of like point to point but i'm like interested when there's less of the figure like or like this kind of like hybrid of the figure with the objects and how that communicates like different emotion and like ju just different like psychology when you showed us the image in the Pesha Kusha of your first sort of, what you t the radical piece, the first time you put your, scu your sculptures, your ceramics on legs, mm. can you tell us a little bit more about how that launched you into this new way of, of making? Yeah, so when I made that face jug, I had just learned about the tr tradition of the, the Edgeville ceramics and like the face jugs there and like learning that that came from, that was like a, a custom that came from, from Africa. So um, I feel like, I don't know what the, what the logic was, but I was like, oh, let me make one of these without a face and just with the ears is like this all like uh, hearing like entity or this all hearing uh, ob object like you could almost whisper to it and like your secrets are like kind of confined and contained in that space and like that stool I made for like a play that I was like collaborating collaborating with the theater group and like there's like oh we want these ceramic chairs I'm like I don't know if you want ceramic chairs to be moving around and like throwing in the air and whatnot so they ended up not using it and I was sitting in my studio and kind of like looked at the width of the base of the vessel and looked at the base of the chair and I was just like, yo, these two could kind of like go together. And like, I was always showing my work on kind of like pedestals before then and the energy was just different and the energy of like those two kind of just felt right. And it kind of like helped me to think about like how do I kind of control the context and like what the art sits on as much as possible. And you're still working in this, you're continuing this yeah. investigation yeah. to this day. And it reminds me, that, um, at the Amy Freeberg Cult uh, stand Gallery that's right out here, um, as you enter and exit this, this stage here, uh, there's a new piece by Masako, which is based also, you mentioned, you, you, 
you have similar and very different modalities in your practices, but it's there's a lot to dialogue with. You have a piece, a yokai, that is actually a sound. You talk about the sound creature. Could you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, so I think, um, and in my work, I'm referring to the shapeshifters, which are the ancient characters, and that's based on the um, Shinto animism. And this animism has been practiced in different regions of the world, but the, the one that that I feel very connected to as part of my investigations of my identity. Um, you know, the Shinto animism really is about the non-human centric ideas that your human species are just a part of the universe. And now we, we dominate everything as a human species, <laughs> but it really reminds us that everything has the spirituality um, if that exists. And a lot of time the physical um, entity is you know the necessary of necessity to carry that spirituality and then that one is a very different one it's a sound one but with sound you hear it become part of your energies and rhythms and then you know so it's a tactile experiences that you can um you can have by when you're listening to the music so i felt like i have to invent the new shapeshifters um, and they tend to stay in the forest. They <laughs> stay. Yeah. Well, both of you in your practice, you move from the 2D to the 3D with this incredible um, uh, ease and sort of di those, the 3D and 2D are dialoguing. And I know that you, Woody, talk about them co constantly cross-contaminating and you don't really see it sometimes in your studio, don't find a distinction between the, the two modalities. And as well, and Masako, you also work uh, uh, in watercolor and 2D. And I was wondering if you could both talk about these different practices and how how they relate to a, a larger um, sort of philosophy of your practice. Mm. Maybe you could start. Or you could start. Okay. Um, <laughs> So I, you know, I started as a, a painter. So when I you go to grad school, that was my pictorial, that was my major. So I always consider myself as a 2D artist, um, but then now I'm doing a lot of 3D work. And I think, so like the way that I process the creative process is always still like a two dimensional, I think. Meaning like, um, I don't think about the gravity, which is a huge, deal when you're <laughs> making bronze sculptures, right? And then the, uh, the felt sculptures, I have to make sure it stands safely. And then I have to make sure that it fits in a door and like how many people it needs to carry that in. Like all that logistic and actuality comes with the sense of gravity, which I don't have that in the initial stage of the, the uh, process. Um, so it's a kind of, I'm learning about it, but to me, the different, entity, different 2D dimensions and three dimension, I think they just bring a different expressions. Um, and I feel like, you know, as my work is about shape shift, and I feel like it makes sense to have a very different, diverse practice. And I just enjoy working with both. So unless I think I, I'll stop working when I stop having fun. <laughs> so. Yeah, I feel like very similarly, you know, I had that, uh, the Beiji uh, deity up there and it's like that twin energy. So just having like, again, yeah, yeah, just like, um, you know, the sculptures, like you have to like, kind of like think more concretely and like think about like, you know, gravity and like, yeah. you know, is this thing gonna fall over? Is this thing <laughs> gonna survive in the count? And, you know, the painting and 2D stuff is just like an intuitive way of working and like yeah. more of an expressive way to kind of like get the ideas out. Yeah, and it can be very direct because yeah. you don't have to filter too much. Yeah, through the materials. Yeah. And both of you started out with what I, we often refer to as more humble materials, which I'm not sure I agree with, but ceramics and felt, mm -hmm. um, the more craft materials. Uh, and you both have just, recently not only just scaled up with your fountain and with your Uber projects, literally scaled up in the most radical way. Masako's initial uh, yokais were this big. They could be placed on your desk and you would bear, you'd have to look for them. 
and and now she's working in in this very large scale. So you started out with these materials, and you both moved to bronze. And I'm really interested in that kind that kind of dis disruption in your practices in a way, and what it means to move to this what is considered a just a, a really um, non-humble, would we, <laughs> material. Right. I, I, either way. Both of you, either you, Woody. <laughs> um, yeah, the bronze is just, uh, you know, I'm like right now I'm thinking about like that, uh, that Magritte image that I had in the Picha Kucha and like just the, the change of scale and what happens when you're able to, uh, like scale something up and have things that are like at a different scale and how that relates to your body. So, um, yeah, like, yeah, that's just the, 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 the scale and being able to be more ambitious is like really exciting. And there's a lot of the, the kind of like sculptural kind of like thinking that, that I'm doing in ceramics. Like I can only do it to a certain scale and working in the bronze, uh, is, is enabling, enabling me to kind of like, kind of be more expansive with, uh, with, with my thoughts. So I think my uh, bronze sculpture is on the uh, public art domain, so it's, um, it's open to public, and then that was one of the reasons why I really wanted to do the project. Um, so when I can enlarge the, and these are discarded objects, that was actually decided that they're replaceable, so they're not worth anything, so that's, be, that's why they've been discarded. But I just felt so interesting to make them monumental size of things being devalued or decided devalue. It's not important. Um, and I feel like that represents like an ordinary sort of being like myself, you know? And I feel like kind of amplifying these like faces that has no name. I felt like it was a really interesting, you know, kind of privilege as an artist to, to bring out that uh, narrative. Um, and also, I feel like that really translates the accessibility that when it's that big and outdoor, anybody can visit and it has a different sort of um, interactions. Um, so, you know, that's been a really important idea for me as an artist, like how as an artist, like how could I make differences? Um, and why do we have these narratives as an artist? Why, why is it important? And then I think important aspect is to be able to share in a large audience. And I think that monumental size working the bronze, you know, I can't have a felt outdoor. So, <laughs> you know, so that works. It's felt <laughs> is, is can be damaged too easily. So there's yeah. a practical, obviously, engineering aspect to, the, yeah. to these works as well. Right. So I'm going to ask one last question, and then we're going to open up um, questions to the audience. And, um, and it's a question that I, I find always a little hard to, to answer, because it's about humor. And it's always not funny to talk about humor. But what I find in your, both of your works, there's an incredible level of playfulness and humor. I, w I wouldn't use necessarily say accessibility, but um, certainly people you love to Instagram themselves with both of your works, and that's a, actually a great thing, right? We, so we get to see it more. Um, but there's also this level of humor I know with Woody. I mean, you're constantly the word plays, and, the, and there's always this, you know, pivoting of the concept and the object. Um, so I'm wondering if you guys had anything to say about humor and art, because I once tried to curate a show about humor and art, and it just fell. <laughs> it was couldn't do it. So do you feel like there's an element that you're uh, sort of intentional about or not? It's fun to be in the studio. <laughs> You're having good time. Yeah. Good time. I feel like it's generally like that. That part just comes out yeah. in the work, you know. Like being in the studio is such a privilege. But I also think humor is like a tool, or like maybe like a, a byproduct of like having like overcome or like going through some type of growth or being able to like look at something that was previously a little bit hard to like sit with, but like 
have have a bit of like uh, this like resilient quality to it. So I feel like humor to me often comes out out of, uh, for lack of a better word, like pain. Yeah, I think um, it's sort of, you know, like an expression comes very naturally. I don't try to make it look funny or, you know, with a sense of humor. It's just sort of how I perceive things and how I translate. So, um, but that's one thing. But I, I obviously enjoy making that way. And it seems like it make people laugh or like, you know, like make it a huggable or whatever. <laughs> um, but I think that it is my intention to make my work very playful because I think that playfulness invites the exploration. And exploration is the way we learn and education. You learn by exploring. If you know the goal, you're not learning, you know. So I think that playfulness to me equal to the exploration, and that means you have your own journey to really kind of find some, it's a discovery process. Um, so to me, it's a very important that you don't know what it is that you're looking at it, but it looks so inviting so that you maybe start reading about the shapeshifters um, or you know the books that the Woody's been inspired by, you know. So like I feel like it's a really entry point where that we start to explore, and I think it's very important in a society to continue to have the sense of exploration so that we continue to discover something new. Well, thank you both so much for this conversation, and apologies about the images, <laughs> and thank you to the audience. Um, We'll be taking questions from the audience now, so please feel free. I don't know, are they handing out? Oh, yes, we're handing out. Um, any questions? Well, you have a question? Stanley has a question. Oh, come on. Oh, Stanley doesn't have a question. Oh, you answered them all. <laughs> well, I had you. Well, I'm going to ask questions then, yeah. since. Um, so, <laughs> I'm surprised there are no questions out there. <laughs> Minna, you have a question. I know you do. Minna has a question. <laughs> I'll hold it. I can tell. Okay. <laughs> I know when Minna has a question. Can I? Can I take my mask? Or? No. Okay. Can't take my mask. Okay. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Um, I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit more about the, this idea of, uh, of the, I mean, bronze is a very intense uh, uh, medium, and it seems like it, it moves away from play, playfulness and disposability. And can you talk about the tension that that, is there a tension there? I mean, it's yeah. Oh, so hard to hear. The question was that bronze is an intense material and seems to move away from some of the ideas of disposability and tactileness and playfulness in both of your works. Is what um, she was asking, and um, can you sort of respond to that contradictions? Is that for both? Yeah. Um, I think that it, it's, again, also as an artist, um, I, I, I want to continue to explore a different medium. And in the bronze, it was a sort of op opportunity to have something outdoor, too. But at the same time, I was thinking about, so the, the, in the Pecha Kucha slice, I had a Sugimoto's glass stage, right? And then that one, it's actually built with the temple construction so that the legs are actually just made with the, uh, the, just the wood. So there's no screw. Everybody's familiar with that, the Japanese temple constructions. And then, so Sugimoto talks about thinking about how the piece is going to disappear in the future and, how, and what will be remained in 1,500 years later and so I was kind of thinking like, and at the time I was working with the bronze, so it's like, wow. So what part of this bronze supposedly lasts a long time? And I wonder, and I read about cave painting, all these mythologies, and I really wonder about 
what will remain <laughs> in the futures. And then we all talk about what was, you know, painted in a cave and, you know, so I'm kind of curious what will be the sort of residue of our, our you know, legacies. Yeah, and bronze will definitely <laughs> last longer than yeah, felt. Yeah, maybe no color. Or maybe not. We you know, I don't know. So, so I was kind of uh, excited about the idea exploring different medium is that that particular weight that I don't use in a studio. Yeah. How about you, Woody? Do you? Uh, I think oh, yes. Susan, we have a, oh, we have a oh, question. Have oh, 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 we have a question. We have questions now. That's great. Yeah. Hi. Um, I was curious, as you mentioned before, in the age of Instagram and how that's impacting um, the shareability of your work and like the popularity, you can say in quotations. Um, does that influence, the, how does it influence what you create nowadays, especially when you're thinking about 3D and larger scale projects? Does that, do you think about that as a factor of your final product? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> no. Yeah, I feel like Instagram is a, uh, yeah, me, Instagram is Instagram, you know? I, I know when I'm in the studio, when I'm in production, I like to kind of like be digesting a little bit less and be more intentional about the, the things coming into like my orbit in terms of like, you know, what's uh, occupying like, you know, my passive mind state. And, you know, sometimes if you're like scrolling, like I feel like, um, you just get influenced by things whether you want to get influenced by them or not. You know, I feel like in terms, I know for me it's important to, to kind of like make artwork that feels accessible in a way, not on like in terms of like social media, but in a way of like, you know, somebody could look at a clock or, you know, a side table or a, a vent or like some type of like everyday object and have some type of like a uh, relatable, you know, experience with it and then start to question like, okay, like I know what this object is. Why is it being warped in this type of way? Why does the color look like this? So I feel like, you know, it's it, the, the idea of accessibility, you know, I think about a lot, but not in the terms of like making, you know, work that's, that's like Instagrammable. It's, uh, it, I shouldn't have mentioned Instagram earlier, sorry. <laughs> But also, I like what you just said, and uh, um, something to think about in relation to both of your works is the use of color mm -hmm. and how you guys both engage in these very vibrant colors. And you mentioned your love of orange earlier, and mm -hmm. clearly, but we don't have time for that. We do have another question, though, from Susan in the front. Well, first of all, I want to thank you all. This has been fantastic. Um, and. I, I love the materials that you're talking about now, but I also love your works, your, your paintings. And I wonder if sometimes they're your own sort of private metaverse <laughs> and, and, and you pull these objects from that or if these objects then end up back in your paintings or uh, you know, where, where do the paintings come to the scheme of these things? So I think for my case that I'm, you know, reinventing and then um, also inventing the new characters based on this ancient mythologies. And um, I feel like I'm just reinventing like uh, uh, people that I know or my friends in a real family, life. A and family. family. Yeah. And then so I'm creating sort of like a community in, in my drawing. And sometimes it comes from the sculpture piece or I have a same title. I have a lot of same titles in my work, but in a different iteration, if it's a drawing format versus the sculptures. Um, and I, I tend to like to create that Hyakkiyagyo is a pandemonia image in a Western tradition. So it's an uproar of this discarded object. So I need to have a lot of characters in it. Uh, so. It's somewhat organic. Uh, sometimes I look at the ancient sort of illustration from Edo period, the Muromachi period, uh, but a lot of time I just kind of, you know, come up with it. So it's still the mystical process to me. I don't know where it comes from. 
<laughs> yeah. I think it's important to kind of like have these things in place where we could kind of just like explore and wander and like doodling is a perfect way of just like opening up your mind to like your, your intuition. You know, I feel like a lot of times when I'm drawing or like drawing is like, what am I gonna draw? Then I just start looking at my apartment and making still life drawings or like blind contour stuff. And like, I feel like a lot of like the, the visual vocabulary that I've adapted has come from that passive, just kind of like looking at my environment and really kind of like having this, uh, like this, like, uh, I don't know, just like a mental kind of like exercise of like looking at something or not looking at something and drawing it. Great. Thank you. So I think we're going to wrap it up, but welcome anybody to the stage to talk to all, any of us afterwards. And thank you so much for giving us your time today. Beautiful day in San Francisco. Enjoy fog. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both to Woody and Masako.